put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Universal Soldier, the one you return, the return. We'll review. Luke is the sole survivor of the original Universal Soldier team, and he is now working with Dylan Kotner to improve the Universal Soldier program. The new entity in charge of the Universal Soldiers is a machine known as Seth. When the government decide to terminate the project, which includes shutting Seth down, he kills Dylan, Xander Berkeley really going beyond his typecasting there, and he demands Luke input the code which without which his program will be deleted. It has to be entered know, every 12 hours, 8 hours, something. Every, every day at least. Of course, given that Dylan also knew the code, he probably shouldn't have killed 50% of the people who knew the code. He, in, in order to get Luke he sends out his poorly aiming and easily defeated Universal Soldiers to, yeah, basically, you know, not kill him, but, but bring him back. And that, of course, means that they can only do it via melee, because shooting someone in the leg or the arm to make it easier to kidnap them is completely unheard of. And, you know, tasers and, you know, batons and such, they, they don't even exist. So that's not an issue at all. And, you know, it's, it is true that the, the Universal Soldiers still keep coming. But it's far too easy for Luke to take them out. And there's, of course, also the issues of just... Why does Seth suddenly, which he does, he basically declares himself a deity. And, you know, he also gets a unisol body so he can move around. Yeah, he basically declares himself a deity. He started out as basically a general. Let's, let's go with that. He was in control of this one program. You know, he controls these soldiers. That's it. That makes him essentially a general. Why does he suddenly declare himself a deity? Let's let's briefly go through the various, much more interesting, you know, computers that have run amok and are really, really dangerous. Skynet basically sees the entire human race as dangerous and thus tries to eliminate the entire human race the, the way you would try to eliminate the enemy forces. It doesn't, you know, think it's. It doesn't think that it should run the world. It just thinks that humanity shouldn't, because they're too dangerous. You know, so humanity has to be prevented from being able to fight back. Glados basically just, you know, it was programmed to run these tests, so it's running these tests. You know, even if people get killed along the way, it has tests to run. Shodan, she does see herself a deity because, yeah, she was she was made to control this entire space station, and yeah, she went mad with that power with all these genetic mutation and you know these these experimental weapons and the like all at her disposal. Yeah, she thought she was just 
Yeah, completely. And so she does try, you know, she takes over the, yeah, the, the space station and she threatens to destroy Earth. Because, yeah, she's, she's the one in charge. So she's, you know, eliminating the ones who could be a threat to her. All of these, I would argue, make sense. But Seth, general deity, I, I don't know how he, how he got there. Wait, wait, he's an American military computer, so he thinks that he should go out and at the very least establish military bases in all countries that might at some point become enemies. Last minute notes, yet again. Something that right away shows us that this is clearly a piece of fiction is that the reason they're terminating the project is because of budget cuts in defense spending. Then again, I guess you know this was you know two years before 9/11, so I don't I don't know for sure if back then they maybe did cut, but today the idea of cutting military spending is absolutely ludicrous. And it also says, you know, the, the, the general who argues against it, who's, you know, coming in to tell them that the program has been shut, is, is going to be terminated, he says that the original program killed dozens of civilians. I think he needs to rewatch the first movie again because that is not even remotely true. I mean, I'm not going to give away exactly the like you know the body count of the first one, but yeah, I did. That's that's absolutely ridiculous. That's that's nowhere near the. I, yeah, I suppose I could reveal. They don't kill that many in the first one. Not not even close. Now. In this one, the, the reporter character's cameraman is killed mostly because the first one did it. This is kind of... This is one of those times where they redo scenes and or alter them slightly without any understanding of what made the scenes work in the first place. I like to call this Paul W.S. Andersoning. But admittedly, he is far from the only one. But yeah, that happens with a ton of adaptations and, you know, remakes, reboots, sequels. Yeah, it is, you know, they look over well, what happened in the first one and then, oh, let's try to do that again. And yeah, I mean, it, it's not even. For, it's not even particularly clear why the reporter is so dead set at getting, you know, the the report in this one, or why this report is happening now. She doesn't know that the program is being shut down, as, as far as we're, as, as far as I could tell, definitely. It's, you know, it, it, it has literally just been told to the, yeah. And I'm also not entirely sure why they need to go all the way inside to get, like, footage of the project that's being shut down. And it's not like this project has just been launched. That was the thing. In the first one, you know, they say this was the third successful operation for the Unisols. Okay, they're still new. It's still, you know, people still want to get that story. And the reporter has just been fired. So she thinks, if I can get the scoop on this, they'll have to give me back my job. And she gets the, the cameraman to go along with it because they're, they're old friends. And, you know, but in this, I don't know what exactly is. We, we, we have no idea how long the program has been running. No, nothing is said about it. It's just that it's being shut down. And if somehow she realized that it was going to be shut down, yeah, she really got the scoop on that one. Now, the... The, the the female roles in this basically accomplish nothing or they accomplish something that wasn't really necessary and or could have been written out easily 
or they actually do damage to you know the the cause they're they're literally just there to be you know victims and or pretty now when you know they the which is of course you know the, the reason that they're incompetent and or downright harmful is of course that you know it this this is trying to you know put put forth this idea that women are just useless in you know situations where you know guns and running and such is required there are times where Seth will talk and what he's saying will also be written on a computer monitor and there are times where this doesn't even match up I mean it's if any kind of you know if anything would have the the two properly match it would be when a computer speaks now it's it's established fairly early on that actually I should briefly say the the reporter in this Erin I'm pretty sure she's supposed to be like really obnoxious and you know we were supposed to really laugh when she gets like flustered or you know stuff now yes this fairly early on they establish that the military can't just blow up the building that Seth is in because there are you know the the facility is full of chemical weapons I realized that it's possible that these guys did not watch Terminator 1 and 2 but even so why would you put chemical weaponry right by the computer the computer might malfunction you know it's it's it, these are the kinds of things that you have you know proper backup plans for you don't just put a t why not just have him in a separate facility and the, the the chemical weapons in you know facilities that can really take you know a lot of damage without breaking you know and and have the computer in a maybe it should also have some shielding but those shields should be able to be turned off by the relevant people such as Luke from the outside the the general in this I'm not sure he or anyone else realizes that he's the general because he's constantly being ordered around Luke orders him around and at one point he gives the order to shoot at you know fire at unisols and after the unisols fall down which you know anyone who knows just a little bit about the unisols knows that that's not gonna actually stop them then everybody stops firing and he says keep firing and then a you know another officer who's you know not as high ranking says sir they're down and then he orders two guys to run up to the unisols and check you just disobeyed a direct order from a superior that's ridiculous and, and the general doesn't even bring it up now in this for almost the entirety the unisols only really use one gun now, granted it is a cool looking one I used to know what it's called oh, the OICW and it's got like um you know it's essentially an assault rifle a high powered assault rifle and it's got like a grenade launcher which often doesn't behave like a grenade launcher but yeah I mean the first one they're they're you know using M60s and jackhammers and desert eagles you know and and in this it's just the one gun pretty much one thing this does you know have which when when you go to a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie you kind of want to see him do his karate thing he doesn't do that all that much in the first one especially for the first while when he's a unisole and entirely under control he doesn't do a lot of karate because you know it's not necessarily the deadliest 
way to, to, to you know, and he has guns and, and such. In this, he does it from right away. You know, the 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 very first fights has him using it, so that's something at least. I mentioned that the the women don't really accomplish anything. There's this thing of you know, oh, they can't handle you know guns and such. I don't know if the, the makers of this movie realize women make up 50% of the U.S. There are women in the NRA. You you, you guys get that right? They can shoot. They can they can shoot real well. It's it's not like. <laughs> You know, there, there are women who take it upon entirely upon themselves to be able to use a gun to defend themselves. You know, in case they're by themselves, and you know, some of them maybe aren't married, or you know, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. The the jokes are almost all really lame. Now, I mentioned that, you know, Seth makes himself a body. It's Michael J. White, Michael J. White's body. And, you know, Seth was always, in this Seth, the, the voice of Seth is always the voice of Michael J. White. And you don't hire Michael J. White just for the voice. You hire him so he can kick some ass. Now... I'm not entirely clear why the Universal Soldiers have personality. In the first one, that was basically all suppressed. They are just mindless machines. That's part of the appeal. You know, in this, they're constantly like smiling, smirking, you know, yeah. Some of them make jokes and such. I also, everybody who has, you know, the, the, the military, Luke, Everybody who's fighting the Unisols know that you can't just shoot them with bullets. This is this was this was a thing in the first one. You know, not again, not. I'm I'm not really going to be spoiling the first one. I'm I'm trying to keep details vague. But in the first one, from very early on, it's established you can shoot them with bullets. They can come back from that. The opening of the first one is Jean Claude Van Damme, and. Dolph Lundgren shooting each other to death and five or ten minutes later you see them walking around you don't know why immediately but clearly they don't they can't be stopped by just bullets you know and even if you're you know okay so time passed between it. okay but within another five minutes or so you see Unisol being you know completely perforated in his chest and seconds later, he's getting up and killing. So, yeah, for some reason, nobody uses grenades. You know, for for most of this, they don't use grenades when fighting the Unisols. It it's preposterous, and it's also like, do they only have guns that fire bullets? This is this is the military we're talking about. They're they're remarkably well armed. They're supposed to be remarkably remarkably well armed and these guys know that they're fighting unisols why wouldn't they bring in bigger guns okay maybe maybe they can't you know blow up the facility itself the moment unisols start you know walking outside to you know kind of guard and take out military and such that exact moment you could be attacking just the unisols just outside the building you could be bombing those bring, bring in some mortars bring in you know just heck you know, pummel them with pineapple grenades. This is this is not this is not a difficult concept. Did they not have a plan in case the Unisols at some point turned against them? Because that's that's kind of one of the first things you want to do when you develop a really powerful weapon is figure out how you can defend against it. Again, tasers might be might be useful. You know, okay, so they can't be killed. You can they're they're, they're human bodies though. You can incapacitate human bodies. You know, this, yeah, the choreography of the action can be really bad. There, there are times where you cannot tell where two people fighting each other really are in relation to each other. And the continuity can be terrible. Like, there, there's a part where Luke is, like, reaching for a gun and then cuts, and then he has the gun and he's standing up. 
and this is like a fraction of a second between there's there's no way that he could have gotten it. yeah now I do not know why but the the unisols regenerating now regenerate in what appears to be beach chairs you know the kind you know you can kind of lie down on the beach kind of you know metal -y, I think some yeah in in general that this has some really dumb cool designs the you know we're, we're in the first one you had the the eye patch kind of thing that makes sense there's there's a camera in there in front of one of the eyes so the you know what the universe soul sees with that eye is being picked up by the camera and you know and it's like for him it's like a viewfinder so he can look through it but there's also a camera there so everything he sees is being transmitted to you know the the technicians running him that makes sense in this they're wearing yellow sunglasses and then they have this thing on the side I guess maybe that's supposed to be a camera it's real easy to knock sunglasses off someone I mean in the first one it's made clear the 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 headset that they have the full headset it doesn't really I'm also not entirely I, I guess the, there could also be a microphone in there and they, they do at least have have earbuds so so that part is covered but yeah you know in the first one it's a full-on headset that thing doesn't just come off by you know you slipping on something or stumbling into something sunglasses can, can come off really easy, especially the kind they they have they're, they're really not you know very tight screw they, they don't really come off in this but it's still you know you're wondering why they're not coming off and why this isn't just properly you know set in there now the Romeo Bill Goldberg in this has this running thing of you know he apparently doesn't like Luke it, you know Luke figures early on and then you know every time Luke you know easily defeats him he'll say I hate that guy you know and yeah so that's this running thing and that's supposed to be funny I think now this movie is 76 minutes, not counting the end credits. The the end credit is only at three minutes. The the you know poor guys who had to make the the video seem like it. The video actually claims to be an hour and 36 minutes. They do put in a full eight minutes of trailers before it. So you know, yeah, that that brings us to 86 minutes. You know, to 87 minutes total. I cannot do math apparently. Yeah, that's that's not even quite an hour and a half. That's wow. The story is bad and there are a ton of pointless scenes. Things are really stretched out. There are nonsense twists and so many times where the film could have ended if just a you know a major character excuse me hadn't been an idiot um, one of the things is that Seth keeps trying to kill Luke when he needs him there's also one point where he could literally grab him and that would be you know but he just walks off this is another in the series of films that I watched years ago that really made an impression on me that I own a copy of and as the last one in this series I think one that I've watched a ton of times and in this case rather than love I loathe this film one of my friends and I had a bunch of 90s action films that we would watch over and over and you know you know, know the the get, go into details about scenes, be able to quote entire. You know, this isn't one of them. The first one was, and we so badly wanted this to be 
a worthy follow-up and for the longest time we refuse to admit to ourselves or each other that it's a truly awful movie. The first one doesn't need and doesn't really leave itself open to sequels. It's very self-contained. This film ignores the two made-for-TV sequels, which I have not watched, and itself is no longer canon. I haven't watched the two other sequels. I hear that they're better. I, I don't think I'll watch them. Again, I just the first one really didn't need a sequel. Somehow, Luke is normal in this one. I'm not going to spoil the science of the first one, but yeah, he died in that opening scene. He does not somehow, you know, come back to being a regular human being after that. And the... Yeah, he's, he's now a technical expert working for the government. And in this, they have him grieve over, you know, fallen friend, you know, among others, Dylan Kotner and such. And that is really not, the, the, the poor guy does not have that much range. And the first one, they were smart enough to hide that by making him basically innocent, naive, and utilizing his pretty good comic timing. These are things he can pull off. Grief is not one of them. Now, the... The, you know, it, it's... It's strange that he is now in favor of the universal soldier when, you know, it's, it's not really spelled out, but presumably they are still being used against their will, like in the first one. And they probably have families who would appreciate the closure of, yeah, you know, and yeah, that, that as well is a problem that he faced in the first one. The first movie is in part specifically telling us these are problems with an idea such as the Universal Soldier Program. This is why we can't just take an easy out of, of this, you know, it, the, the, the fact that the military suffers losses is a necessary evil. And in this one, the, the movie is like, you know, Luke is like arguing, well, if, you know, if we don't have the Universal Soldier Program, obviously, you know, more American soldiers are just going to die. So it seems to be trying to argue in favor of the Universal Again, presumably the people making this did watch the first movie at some point or read the Cliff's Notes. The first one is specifically saying, this would be a terrible idea. Here's why, you know. And it's not like this does ultimately come around on that idea, you might say. But it is still strange to see the film and Luke especially start out so in favor of it. Now he married Veronica, and somehow they had a kid in spite of him being dead and. Veronica died in between movies, freeing him up for another reporter to, you know, fall in love with. And yes, the child is purely there as leverage against him for, you know, Seth to have. Although, to be fair, given her stint on Charmed, I suppose we should be grateful that she doesn't just show up a few times, barely affect the plot, and then disappear entirely. Now, with, yeah, between him losing Veronica and going on to actually help the Universal Soldier program, this is a far more depressing and bleak outcome to the first movie than the alternate ending was. So, yes, Aaron Young is the new reporter, who again wants the scoop. She is more confident and less chatty, although I think that does basically translate into, oh, she's so obnoxious, just, yeah, 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 you know, yammering on, just stop talking, let the men handle it, you know, just, yeah. 
and yeah, she, you know, otherwise she's basically a copy-paste replacement. However, where the original was drenched in machismo and still had room for and trust of the audience to deal with a female protagonist, Veronica was active. She freed herself more than once. She drove the plot. She saved Luke. Here, Aaron is as useless in the way and as negatively gender stereotyped as far too often happens to major female characters in action and sadly some other genres as well. I'm afraid I don't remember the poster's name, but I read on the IMDb boards for Swordfish something that fits rather well for this and the genre in general. The females in the film are all victims and or sexually promiscuous and I, I would add that the, the the sexual promiscuity is both so that you know the man can disrespect her because uh, she's easy and so that you know he'll want to have sex with her so that she doesn't have to be you know because if if he had to put himself out there and and actually like this person maybe maybe try for a relationship or be friends at least for a while or or something ah oh, that's uh, all those emotions not manly enough so no 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 I'll have sex with her but that's it you know do, you know no respect whatsoever you know because the 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 sheer notion that a woman might deserve respect might even be you know, worthy of the same treatment as a man is just ridiculous. You know, I mean, it's like, I mean, like, I mean, Turner, it's, it's like, just, just, you know, I, I, I still don't even know why, why we let them vote or anything. The... I already mentioned that Bill Goldberg, the pro wrestler in this, <laughs> he he acts. I've avoided most pro wrestler movies, but I have watched every film brain Batman beatdown review, and yeah, uh, I am I am very happy to have steered clear of it. But yes, the the character Romeo played by Bill Goldberg is essentially Seth's main muscle and more so comic relief. He will make awful puns and he'll be beaten in hilarious ways that you know including a truck parked on top of him. And yes, this has absolutely terrible acting and it doesn't hide it like the first did. And also you know neither Romeo nor Seth is that fun or memorable or a fraction of uh, as cool as the concept allows for villain and yeah it just I mean we have a computer who's who's gone haywire who is in control of a ton of seemingly unstoppable used to be unstoppable in the first one seemingly unstoppable soldiers fighting the US military this is there's there's no reason this movie should suck this much at least there there's there are ideas here that are just completely wasted on something this dumb now, while the, the final fight does have its moments, you know, mostly because Michael Jai White is a badass, but, you know, just, you know, and, and he doesn't get to show it an awful lot in this or, or Spawn, but, yeah, you know, the, the man can actually fight, and, yeah. Now, this movie has a nerd character, who basically he programmed Seth and this is a really great character it's, he does have some problems there there are elements to him that aren't so great that are they're actually kind of silly maybe even ridiculous 
the way he talks, what he says, the way he moves, his hair, his general just manner of movement. I'm pretty sure this guy thinks he's Bill Paxton. He really wishes he was. And just, yeah. Now, this doesn't really have much in the way of ongoing conflict between the characters, and that does leave a Lundgren-sized hole in its place. Not to mention that there easily could be. You know, it could be between Luke and Romeo, it could be between Luke and Seth. We're told that they've been working together for three years, which I suppose actually might answer my earlier question about how long it's been running. So yeah, three years and the press hasn't gotten a decent story of them. When when it's apparently now being perfectly, you know, it's only now being shut down by the U.S. military. Apparently, for three years, the U.S. military was perfectly fine with it. Since when does the U.S. military not happily put on a big smile and show off its guns for the press? Again, at least certainly in more recent years, they will very happily talk about, you know, how how utterly amazing they are. And... Yeah, it's it's there there could easily be this really interesting ongoing conflict and it it sort of kind of tries with you know Romeo ongoing you know I hate that guy and you know Seth killing Dylan and then Luke is upset with him for that and it's just it's not properly done that to be fair, no relationship of this is particularly interesting. I, I don't think this movie even really understands how people work. It's, it's really just put together by a bunch of cliches. And as you know, as with this this concept that is really cool of you know this this mobile you know computer brain that can control a ton of you know, really powerful forces and can, you know, is trying to fight, you know, humanity and such. To be fair, Avengers 2 Age of Ultron only did just come out, and this movie couldn't, obviously, couldn't possibly have, you know, predicted that in 16 years so, so something so much better would come along that would have some of the same ideas, but I do think that movie is an amazing example of how much more you could do with this idea. The just, yeah, I mean, Seth barely moves outside of his base, so what was the point of the body if he's almost just gonna stay there? And what's the point of him controlling all the Unisols from very far away? In the first one, they didn't appear to be able to move that far away from the truck that they were controlled from. Now it's, you know, like, I, I don't even know if it's like internet or something, but even if Seth has to move with them, they could still do more than just go outside of the base and half acidly follow Luke and fight with him and then be easily defeated by him. It's just. Yeah. This is directed by a man who worked closely with Mel Gibson, who I have no love for the guy. He is quite reprehensible for you know things he's said and done, but he is talented. So, so this, you know, the, yeah, this this man worked with Mel between '84 and '97. I'm talking, of course, of his personal stunt double, which makes it baffling that he is so bad at hiding stunt doubles in this. The, the opening scene has very obvious stunt doubles for Van Damme, and I don't know, I suppose it is possible that he just wants us to know this is a stunt double, you know, please appreciate all the work we do. The locations and the admittedly plentiful but also tedious and uninspired with multiple pointless scenes of it and nonsense ones and scenes forced in of it action, you know, in some parts more creative than the first one, you know, both are so much more limited than the first one with, again, the, you know, Universal Soldiers just standing guard and 
literally moving outside of the now stationary base rather than the first one hunting Luke through the Midwest and South I think something like that I'm not really good on geography in a truck that they you know big awesome truck that you know when when it opens for the the unisols to come out there's like steam shooting out and just you know yeah it's just it's really sad that this d did so little to go further than the first one you know it's still just this yeah still just guys walking around with big guns the the thing that there is is that it's now a computer controlling them rather than them being given orders by human beings who might not be able to react as fast that's more or less it i mean they it's said that they have really good kevlar maybe i'm not certain it's that much better than in the first one but yeah and you know the the guns that they have which Again, the grenade launcher is far from always dependable as a grenade launcher. But yeah, in general, the locations in this are small and boring. This really feels like a direct-to-video film. The you know, it, it clearly feels fears stalling, so it'll throw action at us, you know, because it's really the only thing it has. And yeah, there's there's really no reason for it to feel so small. It was made on a twenty-four million dollar budget. And granted, you know, I'm not sure twenty-four million in ninety-nine got you what twenty million got you in ninety-two, and you know, CGI, you know you know, where, where the first one was much more practical effects and, you know, now it's more CGI and, you know, especially in 99. Still, there's there's no excuse for looking this bad. Now, this has a very high body count without any real weight to that. It's basically because it can and in order to seem edgy and as I've already kind of said, the first one really didn't need to kill a lot of people, especially civilians and soldiers just doing their jobs, you know, it still managed to show how deadly and destructive the Universal Soldier can be. Now, this has unbelievably gratuitous nudity in that a scene takes place in a topless dancing, you know, bar, which has a full-on bar brawl erupt from what starts out as a few people fighting and I guess this is meant to be the spiritual successor to the fight in the diner in the first one which was a real standout scene both for you know being funny and badass and and this one it's neither the movie is short as already mentioned but also really slow Again, there's there's nowhere near enough plot for as long as it is. It could easily have ended like half an hour in or something. It's also surprisingly sentimental. I already mentioned some of the grief that Luke has to show and him saying, you know, oh great, without Unisols, obviously just more American soldiers will die. And this has a 5% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is appropriate. But the first one has 19%. It should easily have more, but yeah. This is bad even for a Van Damme movie. The excuse me, metal soundtrack is numbing and deafening. Now the there's a lot of this makes no sense going on in this one. There is a an attempted rape in this, or you know, the, the threat of such early on in this, basically in order to 
get a shot of cleavage in and as just sickeningly poor taste that is already in this movie was so proud of that that it put it in the trailers and and not like you know out of concept no 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 it shows you know it's, it's Bill Goldberg and you know one of the the female characters who have nothing to do that's that's why she's there actually to show her cleavage and yeah you know the the trailer clearly shows Bill Goldberg getting ready to and she's tied up and him looking you know really rapey so yeah this is very teenagey with the music and swearing and such and you know, for this movie, you know, characterizing the women as just useless and such. This was the same year that brought us the badassness of Trinity, who clearly, you know, shows herself as very capable. And though, you know, arguably she doesn't get to kick quite as much ass as Neo, she's still up there as one of the biggest badasses of that movie. Now, I agree with most of what Film Brain says about this, but he at one point says that it's very convenient that there's a fire extinguisher. It, again, this happens very early on. Uh, Unisol is set on fire and he has a fire extinguisher in his uniform. And yeah, Film Brain says that's very convenient if that were, you know, if they get into the situation. I don't know about the science of being able to put a proper fire extinguisher in just a Kevlar uniform like that, and I certainly don't know how much it would, you know, how many times you'd be able to use something like that before you'd have to recharge it, but which makes it less, you know, not quite as, as useful as otherwise, but it does make a lot of sense for them to have something like that because in the first one an explosion set fire to a number of the unisols and it was a huge setback in fact it's entirely possible that Luke himself made the suggestion to do this because he would know about this explosion in the first one so yeah I, I gotta say the, the movie the, the pun that goes along with it is terrible and you know the the fact that him being set on fire but immediately being able to extinguish himself makes him being set on fire fairly pointless that notwithstanding it does make sense from a design perspective to put a fire extinguisher in there in the suit So I just mentioned how they were so happy with the rape threat that they put it in the trailer. Not sure you're going to be able to see this, but it's also on the back of the cover. And though it's not entirely clear here on the back of the cover that she is tied up, they do make sure to get a shot of the cleavage and her looking distraught. So it's not exactly saying, you know, come to this movie there's going to be sex as much as come to this movie and watch a woman be sexualized entirely against her will and quite possibly even raped so yeah this if if that's what you want to see this is your movie i've read other parts of this franchise the links are in the description box Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.